G'day legends, I hope that you're all doing well. Now again, this video will have some footage in it that I can't show on this site, but it will be available in length uh, with that on my Patreon, or some clips as well on my Telegram, and thank you for the support in that channel as well while we're here. Now, over the last couple of days, we've talked a lot about the feud between Wagner founder Evgeny Prigozhin and the senior Russian Federation's uh, political figures, and how this has been evolving, and I think you and I and everyone has always had suspicion that this was a sleight of hand, but on what the outcome was going to be, we were not particularly sure. Now, whether that was to get reinforcements or the request of ammunition or what was really going on. And today we have more of an answer with Sergei Sorokivin, who is a Russian Armed Forces Army General and Commander of the Aerospace Forces, who has been appointed as the liaison between the Ministry of Defence of the Russian Federation and Wagner PMC. Now, he has said Yevgeny Prigozhin and I were in contact from the very beginning of the SMO, the Special Military Operation, and I shared with him my opinion on some operations from the very beginning at the Ministry of Defence of the Russian Federation. I opposed the restriction of the supply of weapons and ammunition to PMC Wagner. They restricted me as much as they could, but now I have achieved it. We have now reached a concrete decision that will move our front line from its place. Yes, it cost me a lot, but luckily the train started moving. The shells are already being shipped and their production is increasing. In the near future, it will be decided to regroup some units and organize a blockade of remaining nationalists in the city of Bakhmut. Victory will be ours. Now, in response, Evgeny Prigozhin has said, the bottom line is the following. They promised to give us as much ammunition and weapons as we need to continue further actions. They swear to us that everything will be put up on the flank so that the enemy does not cut us off. We will be told that we act in Artemovsk being Bakhmut as we see fit. And they give us a recognition as a person who will make all decisions in the framework of the military operations of Wagner PMC in cooperation with the Ministry of Defence. Now, this is a big win for Bogosian if it comes to fruition. And have the VDV being the Russian paratroopers cover the flanks in full and not have that shortage of ammunition. Now, to be honest, I do believe Bogosian knew the game that he was playing the whole time with these public allegations. To be an oligarch in that system, you need to know how to play that game and how to use it to your advantage. You know, will we see a push on the 9th of May for Victory Day. This would definitely be good optics for Prigozhin to be able to sell a victory back to the Russian Federation for uh, Victory Day. But even if it has taken months and the expense of many thousands of lives. Although we both know the Bakhmut for both Russia and Ukraine wasn't about taking ground. It was being sold as a meat grinding operation to grind down the other, the other troops to a point where they're incapable of large scale offensives. And I believe this to be somewhat true actually for both sides. Now, Prigozhin claims that the armed forces of Ukraine control only 2.37 square kilometers of the city. And today he's also said we are moving forward waiting for the arrival of ammunition. Now, as I'm writing this video, there are multiple reports of heavy bombardment of Bakhmut and pushes from Wagner. So we're going to have a look on the maps and see what that is. But also, Katerov had this response uh, in his telegram to between uh, the Russian Federation and Wagner PMC. There was so much noise around the private military company, but it was only necessary to finish what we started without unnecessary talk to the whole internet and the whole world. Finish off, put the squeeze on available forces and means changing tactics to reality, just like other units did in conditions of shortage when the 22 they liberated the same complex city as Artemovs. And the statement in some moments with the command PMC remained, but we will deal with this not in the chats or telegram channels in front of everyone and a distance away from each other, but live face to face. And that is what um, Katarov, the leader of the Chechens, had put in his telegram. So, a look at the maps here. We have, of course, Ukraine in the center and the capital of Kiev. The red areas, areas occupied by Russia since 22, and the purple since 14, this being Crimea and Donetsk, Luhansk, and the green areas that have been liberated by Ukraine uh, in the last 14, 15 months. Here we have Romania, Poland, Belarus, and Russia around here. So, where we'll come into is we'll come into Bakhmut. And I will say, before we get too stuck in the maps, Bakhmut is the only place where we have seen any territorial changes over the last 24 hours. So this map updated about four hours ago, and today is the 8th of May. So if we step back to yesterday and then today, we just see in this small region here, some movement of the Russian line further into Bakhmut. Now, there are some maps showing some differences on this as well, and we will compare across those. As always, let's have a look then at the ISW map here. And as we see, the ISW has changed slightly from yesterday, and this dot in the center, I'll show you some geolocated footage from there. What we can see is a difference in assessed Russian control to the claim. So, of course, the yellow is only claimed by Russia, and the red is being assessed. And as we can see, that they have closed up this gap along 
this road down here and have branched out in a few other small places but that is a little bit about it so what is this green dot so if we go back into our videos now i'm not sure what i'll actually be showing online or not <clears throat> This is a Ukrainian Armed Forces troops here moving through at this geolocated position. Now, it is said that on the uh, second and third stories of this, that Wagner PMC soldiers were in these buildings. And something I will say uh, I did notice with this video is that these guys have got reasonable equipment. So this video was released with the title Ukrainian troops lay down covering fire for a squad to withdraw from the south end of the street to the south uh, of the Waka restaurant. Wagner reportedly on the second and third floors in the same building. And here we see these troops moving here, coming out of these windows and moving across. We can just see how close of street fighting uh, that the situation is here and how every building is scarred by you know months of shelling and months of fighting as this drone drone zooms in on these guys that these guys are well equipped with modern you know ar platform rifles modern helmets modern, modern body armor and you'll also see some of these other rifles with cans with uh, suppressors on them as well which is something we see more in the high-end units as well you can see modern helmets modern rifles giving some indication these may not just be normal regular troops here you can see can on the front of this weapon moving through this incredible incredibly difficult situation but right on the outskirts of Bakhmut so working in and around here so there has been Russians at least assessed in this region if they are in that building let's have a look again and compare some maps as we always do so here we have the a Russian sources map as well here we go this is the road we're talking about that loops around here and this is this road with the one through the center and the reservoir and the reservoir here so it is showing that russia have a lot more control up around the blocks in this region than is being shown on this map and have crossed this position here which is backed up as being crossed on the isw here as well now as well what we'll compare are two of war mappers maps between today and as well yesterday so then today's will be not that one today's will be on the right and we can see that russia's further advancement into these northern blocks through here so this is yesterday's we can see that russia have been assessed to control area through here but other than that no other major changes and the road of life through Komove is still open add some more footage around these areas as well but this will definitely be centered on youtube so we have a medical situation in the center of bakhmut here we can see these guys are in a building in bakhmut you can hear a shot and then this guy screaming running back into the building here obviously in pain with an rpg slung behind him now what we see them using here is a chest seal so this is basically just a big sticker with a one-way valve so if you get shot in the chest you can have what they call a sucking chest wound so air coming in and out which you don't want air coming in that way but you need a way for the liquids to then escape build up air things like that this just has a one-way valve to be able to go through there so instead of cleaning the wound here so the sticker can go down sticks on they'll have to take the cap off that as well so that's the one-way valve that white thing we see on the top and then it is completely safe to bandage around like this and then even put body armor back on top of so that is treating a sucking chest wound in that region here we also have footage of Bakhmut from a Ukrainian drone that is showing the outskirts and the rest of the city absolutely on fire and how it's looking here like absolute doomsday in here and everything has been you know destroyed broken down and unrecognizable from what the former city used to be and you can just see the level of impact on everything and the amount of shell impacts and strikes around everywhere and of course as you see many reports from soldiers that everything is on fire now also on the maps i have this green dot here geolocated as well and this is to the northeast of Vugladar. and at this position we have seen the use of uh, Russian TOS-1 Alphas as well, which are their thermobaric multi-launch rocket system against Ukrainian positions. So that is not where this exact footage is geolocated to, but this next footage here of where these strikes are. But it is very similar in the same regions. And you can just see the power of the thermobaric weapons being used here. And the thermobarics have raised a lot of questions about war crimes as well as ethics of using these weapons. Now, these weapons are able to be used legally, but these are an incredibly powerful weapon system. So well, we have a Rybar map actually from a day or so ago but it's showing a different picture again with the red and yellow area being where there's active war fighting happening beyond this road coming down through here and sort of on this location more so where this gray zone is so what people are saying about this gray zone is the gray zone shows what ukraine 
is actually controlling outside of this. So the grey zone is area that at least deep state is saying where there is active fighting and presence in this. So if you take this as the truth, the bits you can actually control at this block here and these regions here and maybe some more in here. But as well as if we look on the deep state that Ukraine is controlling the areas outside of this orange and red. Last night, there's been a number of strikes again across Ukraine and in the capital of Kiev, reportedly with Iranian Shahid drones, with some but not all being shot down and some hitting their targets. You know, some were intercepted and some were shot down over the capital, raising questions around air defense. And this is one of the videos here. So you can hear in this video the Shahid drone and you can see the trace rounds coming up <coughs> in an attempt to hit these drones. The multiple trace over the city here you can see explosions in the background as well an ad coming up getting to altitude turning back to then strike the drone and here and then bringing the drone down over somewhere in western kiev and then you can hear the sound coming in from this distance. Now, the mayor has reported the three people were injured in blasts in Kiev's Solomansky district and two others injured when drone wreckages fell in this district. Now, Shahi Bratchak, the spokesman for the Odessa military administration, has said that Russia fired KH-22 missiles at a warehouse of a food company and a recreational area in the Black Sea coast in Odessa, but with no casualties reported. Now, it wasn't said how many drones actually attacked, but it was reported as a large wave, as Russia seemed now to step up its attacks again deep into Ukrainian territory. Russian sources are claiming also to have shot down a number of drones fired at Crimea last night. So let's have a look at this. Now these are from Russian sources and do keep in mind that numbers of success against aerial targets and the amount of aerial targets are often overreported on both sides. But we'll look at this anyway as it'll as it will tie into what we talk about next. So here we have where they're coming from Odessa and being shot down and this is from Rybar being Russian sources over Crimea here and Rybar saying as well uh, about the massive raid on the Ukrainian UAVs on the Crimea Peninsula. Tonight, Ukrainian formations once again tried to strike with drones at important military and civilian infrastructure at the Crimea and Sevastopol. The AFU, the Armed Forces of Ukraine, launched 23 USVs, 22 Mugovan 5 types, and one TU-141 Swift Jet. This is a Soviet-era drone in three groups of seven UAVs on average from Golny Airfields on Odessa and Hydroport on the northwestern outskirts of the city. As a result of the active work of the air defense systems of the 31st Air Defense Division, the Black Sea Fleet and Electronic Warfare Units, all UAVs were hit and landed near Sevastopol. There was no damage. One of the UAVs fell into a field near the Monastery Highway. Over the past two days, this is the second attempt to strike the Crimean Peninsula on May 6th. Ukrainian formations launched a group of Gron 2 OTRK from a position in Zaporanzia. The rocket fell in a field near the village. The increased frequency of attacks by Ukrainian drones and tactical missiles on the Crimean Peninsula is a direct evidence of preparations for an offensive. It is the southern direction that is of strategic interest to the AFU. We have seen that Russia have been evacuating people, whether by force or voluntary, from the Zaporanzia region down into Crimea, with a lot of questions being raised about Crimea's self-sustainability if the bridge of the Kerch Strait was to be down. As yes, Crimea is surrounded by water, but does not have the water resources to actually self-sustain its own agriculture. This has long been an issue, and I can break this down further if you'd like, but this can buy into the idea that Ukraine could possibly have a starve them out approach to occupied Crimea, although I'm unsure where this would sit in regards to human rights. As no matter what you think about Russian civilians, they are still protected by human rights, as all civilians living on Earth should be. Now, water here has been cut off before, and once by Ukrainian activists by building a sandbag dam in 2014. And this is that dam here that was not built by the government, just by farmers and activists in this region. But then Ukraine did build a proper dam to stop the flow. Now, interestingly, Russia did and has kept the flow of gas into Ukraine since these times and to the current day. Now, Russia has tried to take legal action against Ukraine for this, saying that it is legal to stop water. And we have a look at this here. So. In the absence of international obligation of Ukraine to deliver water to Crimea, Russia referred the alternative solutions based on human rights agreements. In June 2020, Russian lawmakers addressed the UN High Commissioner of Human Rights, complaining that Ukraine has deprived millions of people of basic inalienable right to drinking water. No official reaction followed. So the 
UN did not have any reaction back. On the 14th of September 2020, the Russian Human Rights Council, who is an advisory board to the Russian presidential admin, uh, appealed the OHCHR, claiming that actions of Ukraine contravene the UN Convention of Transboundary Water Courses at International Lakes and the Berlin Rules on Water Sources. This appeal was again without response. In March 21, the Russian envoy to the OSCE listed the violations of the Convention on Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms, allegedly resulting from shutting down the canal. In its interstate complaint, Russia submits that Ukraine's actions violated the rights of residents of Crimea, prohibition of eight respect for private and family life, 14 prohibition to discrimination of the Convention, Article 1 and Protocol 1 right to property, and Article 12 to general prohibition and discrimination. And this as well, talking about these little battles. So, Professor Melina Steria of the Cleveland Marshall College of Law in Ohio says Russia's legal claims to that water, water are unclear under international war. One of the things muddying the waters is that it's not even clear if this is an international dispute because of the world still considers Crimea to legitimately belong to Ukraine. So if you consider the territory of Crimea to be part of Ukraine but occupied by Russia, then the law of occupation, the so-called Fourth Geneva Convention, clearly says that it's the occupier that has the responsibility to ensure the welfare of the people living in that occupied territory. So getting the people of Crimea access to water under this view of the conflict is Russia's problem. Also regarding the claim of human rights violations, Sarah says that this only applies to water for basic human needs. The statute does doesn't assert that a country has to give its neighbours enough water to run fish farms and grow rice. And if you want to go down a huge rabbit hole of this, go look at Saddam Hussein and the dams affecting Iraq. This continues that there are laws governing access to water. International law on access to water is relatively new. A UN convention on the issue only came into effect in 2014. Remember, 2014 is when Russia invaded Crimea. And it helps little in this clash because neither Ukraine nor Russia have signed onto it. Syria is an expert on international law, but she says it gets to be a little bit tricky because international law on water rights is not 100% clear. Now, two days after Russia's second invasion of Ukraine in 22, the dams blocking the flow of water into Crimea were blown up. And since then, Russia has continued to take water from the Dnieper River. This is one of the early achieved goals of the so-called special military operation to restore water to Crimea, as it did somewhat successfully. Now, if or when Ukraine manages to cut the land bridge between Russia and Crimea and retake the southern bank of the Dnieper, one of the first things that will happen is the blocking of flow of water to Crimea. You know, a thousand years ago, if you were besieging a fortified city or a castle, you would prevent supplies from getting in and out. And this goes back to that starvation. Now, there are reports that Russia is filling every reservoir and storage facility in Crimea. And this does give evidence that there is serious concerns about holding onto the southern portion of Kherson and maintaining that flow of water into Crimea. Although Russia still does have a number of long-range weapons to be able to take out dams. Now time will tell exactly what will happen here. And we have seen attempts on the Kerch Strait Bridge before. And it would be interesting to see how the UN would step in on a human rights issue like this being when people are starving, as there has been questions asked about the UN and Crimea's occupants before. Now, lastly, Turkey, who has been somewhat of a neutral country, has refused to give Ukraine its modern S-400 air defense systems that it has bought from Russia in 2017. Now, buying these S-400s sanctioned Turkey from the JSF, the Joint Strike Fighter, or the F-35 program. But it's also the reason we know that S-400s are highly effective against F-16 fighter jets, as Turkey has landed themselves in hot water before, testing the S-400's radars on tracking its own F-16s. Now, Turkey's Ministry of Foreign Affairs has broken the news that the United States has proposed to send S-400s to Ukraine from Turkey, but this was rejected by Turkey, also saying that the US wanted to send someone to also inspect the S-400. This was also rejected. The US said, can you send the S-400s to Ukraine? And we said no. So, legends, that's it today. I hope you're all doing well. Um, if you'd like to support me, there's links down below, but never feel obliged. I'm still really struggling with my voice, and today is the last day of any medication I got given, and with my plans coming up, I can't get in to see uh, an ENT doctor, so that sucks but it is actually affecting me a fair bit um, in actually able to just doing these videos. But look after yourselves. I'll get this fixed up. Uh, have a great day and I'll speak to you soon. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.